So, uh, good morning, and uh, it's always uh, <coughs> a pleasure to be here. So, thank you for the kind invitation. Oh. Yes, So in the next uh, <coughs> 25 minutes or so, the thought, my thought was to share with you uh, what has happened in immunotherapy, why we've done things, what we've done, uh, where we are in the field at this point, and share some of the newer things that, that may be uh, coming down the pipeline. So um, here's, a, here's a patient scan uh, for uh, orientation. So this is the table that this patient is lying on. And the feet are towards you. So we're looking through the feet up towards the head. So the head is behind the screen. And so this would be a cross section at the level of the kidneys. This is the left kidney, and this is the right kidney. So this would be the right side, left side, back, front. So he presented with abdominal discomfort and, uh, and had imaging done. And uh, the imaging showed this right-sided kidney tumor. And at that point, he uh, underwent an intervention uh, that was in the form of a partial nephrectomy. So uh, this is the scan from March of 2014. This is uh, January 2015. What we ski see now here is a scar where that kidney tumor was. Um, at the time of initial diagnosis, when he had the kidney still in place, the diseased kidney still in place, what we also saw was a mass that was very close to the spine involving the bones is with an expansile lesion down here, right there, the dark area that you see. He was followed without any other uh, systemic treatment. Uh, and by January 2015, uh, that mass in the spine had become, had disappeared and had become kind of a scar tissue. So the only intervention that had happened in between these two uh, images that I show you uh, was taking out the, the kidney tumor. There was no other systemic treatment that was administered. So how do we, how do we explain that? Um, these observations have been there, uh, you know, for a long, long time, and the only intervention with surgery uh, and no other systemic intervention led to uh, the thought process that the immune system was doing something that may have been overwhelmed previously, and now having taken out the kidney tumor with trillions of cells in it, now, th now we gave the immune system a chance to uh, equalize uh, the balance. Now, um, what we did not know was how to get the immune system to work on demand. Um, this is what our understanding of the immune response against tumors is. So here's uh, up in the left corner is a tumor, uh, is a tumor cell, and these yellow blobs you see out there are the tumor-specific or tumor-associated proteins or antigens. Some of these uh, tumor cells will die spontaneously, and when they die, uh, they release these uh, antigens or these proteins from the tumor into the system. Now, these uh, proteins are then taken up by the immune system cells called antigen-presenting cells. They process this inside their body and attach it to our self histocompatibility molecules. These are the, the molecules that decide 
uh, what our tissue group is, uh, and then in conjunction with that are presented on the surface of the antigen presenting cells or dendritic cells. Once uh, it is presented in this context, that is when the effector arm of the immune system that comprises of T lymphocytes in, uh, in response against tumors, the T cells now are able to recognize this as something non-self and they start producing various hormones and cytokines and lymphokines to activate the immune response against the tumor. Um, these uh, cytokines uh, or lymphokines kind of represented here with these green uh, blobs, um, they activate the T killer cells and the T killer cells can now get into the tumor and go and kill the tumor cells. That is what our basic kind of understanding of, uh, of the immune response against tumors was. Um, what was uh, identified as one of these hormones or cytokines was a substance called interleukin-2. So this is uh, way back in the 70s that this uh, substance was actually discovered uh, and uh, was noted to be something that was absolutely essential for, uh, for growing the T lymphocytes in culture. Prior to having known about interleukin-2, we could not grow T lymphocytes in culture. So um, Steve Rosenberg uh, at the NIH started using very high doses of uh, IL-2 or interleukin-2 uh, to induce growth and activation of T cells in, in people, uh, and he showed responses uh, in, in disease processes that were uh, resistant to chemotherapy. So this included renal cell carcinoma, this included uh, melanomas, and that is how IL-2 got, um, got approval for uh, renal cell carcinoma in 1992. Um, as Dr. Bidding sh showed us, uh, there's multiple other agents that have been approved since uh, and uh, until 2015 when we saw the approval of nivolumab. So I'm just going to uh, talk about a little bit about IL-2 and talk about uh, the immune manipulation with NEVO or the anti-PD-1 antibody. Um, so this is, uh, this is how the IL-2 story unfolded. Um, these are various studies that have been performed. Now you can see that these are not large studies. These are not like breast cancer studies where you have thousands of uh, folks in, uh, you know, involved. They're small studies and the response rate has varied from about 5, 10 to 15% earlier on. And Later on, it was, uh, it was seen that with certain kinds of uh, histologies or certain kind of pathology, uh, the response rate can be up to about 30%. It's not the response rate that got IL-2 approved. It was essentially this, this phenomena where those folks who responded appear to have very durable responses. So uh, resetting of the immune system with IL-2 in some people will result in cures because cure is defined in, in some ways as you, you, know, you have a response and you're not taking that medicine anymore and the disease is not progressing. So um, this is, a, this is a, a patient who was treated with interleukin-2 uh, this is just a representative CT scan of the chest area. Here's the table with feet towards you. This is a cross section of the body at the level of the heart. Anything black is air. So here's the right lung, left lung. And what we see are these blobs that are all biopsy proven kidney cancer deposits. And uh, this is in fact dated. This is uh, as of three months back, uh, the scan looks completely clean. And all it took was about four months of treatment initially. So
so for, for this individual, that actually translated into a cure because now this patient is not on any uh, systemic treatment, any pill or any other intervention that is ongoing. Um, this, is, uh, this is a representation of uh, those folks who do get responses, complete responses or, uh, or even partial responses. So now note out here, this is time in months. So we're uh, at uh, the de about the 10 year mark out here. These are, you know, the higher the graph, um, more people alive. And farther out the graph, uh, the, the curve, more people alive. So at 120 months, that's 10 years, uh, these folks who had a complete response still remain in, in response. So that's over 10 years out. Uh, those folks who did not have a complete response, that's represented here by this curve out here. These folks also, some of these still remain in response, although their scans are not clearly negative. So this is, uh, this is a phenomena that we've seen with immunotherapy. We've not uh, seen with chemotherapy where either you have a response or you don't have a response. Uh, we do see scans to be abnormal and yet folks do okay. So, uh, so the, the IL-2 was a very crude, uh, in, in a way, very crude um, uh, uh, way of uh, getting immune system to respond on demand. Again, here's the, here's the, now our insights into the immune system grew. So uh, here's the tumor cell, the tumor cell, some of them die, the tumor antigens are released, they come into the antigen presenting cell and then they're presented to the T uh, killer cells or T cytotoxic cells as the first step in generation of an immune response against the tumor. Uh, in that first step, uh, that is initially modified with an accelerator of the immune system, it's called CD28, that binds to something called B7. So initially what you need is uh, you, you need to recognize something as, as bad guys and then you need to have your killer cells accelerated to take care of them. So that's essentially what is happening. But then nature always has uh, built-in controls and uh, one of these controls is a breaking molecule or an off switch for the T cell. Uh, so here's the activated T cell in red and then as it gets to, let's, let's get a T cell speedometer. So let's say the T cells are cruising at 50 miles an hour and then they see something that is, that is non-self or bad guys. And now, the, now they, once the recognition happens, the CD28 uh, kicks in and accelerates that T cell to 100 miles an hour. But as soon as it, as, as soon as it gets to 100, the cruise control for the T cell kicks in. And that cruise control or an off is, is by virtue of an off switch that is called CTLA4 right here. That switches the red activated T cell to an off T cell that is in blue. So uh, the cruise control has now brought the T cell speed back. And what can be done now is to block that off switch and that prevents that T cell from turning off. So the T cell remains active, goes into the, into the tumor and is now going to take care of the tumor cells. Now when it gets to the tumor cell, uh, when it gets into the, into the tumor, there it uh, encounters other forms of, of suppression. So here's a, uh, an activated T cell, gets into the tumor. When it gets into the tumor, what happens is there is another breaking switch or off switch that now becomes operant. And this off switch is called PD-1. The PD-1 doesn't come on by itself like the CTLA-4, but the PD-1 does get activated 
when it uh, interacts with its ligands called PDL1 or PDL2 that can be rec that can be expressed on tumor cells and many other cells. So that results in that red hot activated T cell to be turned off in the tumor. So the tumor cells actually have an inbuilt mechanism to, to uh, resist the T cells that are trying to kill it. And that now can be blocked uh, with either uh, an agent that blocks the PD1 molecule on the T cell or the PDL1 molecule on, uh, on the tumor cell. And that results in the, the T cell not being switched off it remains turned on and takes, uh, takes care of the tumor. So uh, we, we talked about CTLA-4 blockade and we talked about PD-1 blockade. The initial manipulation in uh, um, renal cell that is reported in a phase two study um, was with nivolumab or Nevo, that is an anti-PD-1 antibody. So this was a phase two study uh, using uh, multiple levels, uh, multiple doses of NEVO for individuals who had pretreated disease. So these were individuals who'd had up to three lines of treatment. And uh, when they were treated with nivolumab, um, this is kind of what happened. Uh, these are the, this is the duration of response. This is the two year mark. Uh, Dr. Bitting showed us a case uh, treated with nivolumab. Each of these bars represents an individual, and uh, the red dots represent where they had a response, where a response was documented. The uh, red arrows uh, uh, mark ongoing responses. So uh, these were folks who, some of them were very heavily pretreated, and yet they had responses, and these responses were were uh, very durable. So based on this data, uh, the, the so the phase two studies are generally not practice changing studies. So you have to compare that to an existing standard, whatever the new entity is, you have to compare that to an existing standard. So the existing standard at that point in the second line setting was Everolimus. So the study that was done was compared NEVO with Everolimus. Everolimus is an mTOR inhibitor we saw uh, uh, with Dr. Betting's uh, presentation. And uh, this is uh, what happened in that study. So this is now time in months along the x-axis. This is overall survival probability. Higher the curve, more people alive. Farther out the curve, more people alive. And in this study, uh, NEVO showed an improvement in overall survival over Everolimus. So that then got approval for NEVO in the second line setting because these were all folks who had been previously treated. So in the second, the, it, it was not to say NEVO wouldn't work in the first line, but those were the individuals who were included in the study. So that is where, that is where FDA uh, approved this agent. The re overall response rate is 25% for NEVO and 5% for Everolimus in the study. So now this is kind of a chart of all the agents that are out there. I, I'm going to, I was going to talk only about the immunotherapy agents. So that's hydrogen toluquin 2 that has been approved in the first line setting for carefully selected individuals. And now NEVO got uh, approved as a second line uh, treatment. So uh, where did we then end up going from there? Uh, we started looking at combining immunotherapies uh, with other immunotherapy agents. We uh, also started looking at combining them with the known approved tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And uh, with those agents that may actually alter the tumor microenvironment and make it more conducive to, uh, for the T cells to work 
uh, and the immune response to be more robust inside the tumor. One of these is an IDO1 inhibitor. Um, I'm just going to show you some data from, uh, from the uh, combination uh, studies. Where else, uh, uh, what else is happening? Uh, we need to still figure out how best to dose the, the, the what is the correct dose for these uh, 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 agents. We also need to know how long to use. You know, I was going to ask Dr. Bitton the question, uh, this patient has been on for two years. How long are we going to continue treatment with Nevo? We don't know. Um, and then we are looking at several new immune checkpoint inhibitors or immune modulatory molecules. So let me just show you some of these in interesting data. So um, once we knew that we could block the PD-1 access uh, and induce responses, and we had enough experience with blocking the CTLA-4 molecule, said can we combine those two? Because they're in different sites in the immune response. So the combination treatment, uh, the com combination study happened. Combination study with uh, NEVO and EPI showed an overall response rate of about 40%. And uh, this was the recent uh, update on where these folks are with the durability of response. So um, again, this is time in months. This is probability of overall survival along the vertical axis. The red line is what we, we uh, where half of the individuals are uh, still alive. And the probability with either of these two different dose, doses of Ipi and Nevo, either using Nevo at three milligram or Ipi at three milligram, shows that uh, almost uh, three years out, there is still they have not yet reached that midline. So these are durable responses that are ongoing. And this was a phase one study, so some of these individuals were actually pre-treated. Uh, but the fact is that immunotherapy responses can have the, this kind of durability. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so in, in this study, the initial, uh, so they initially got four doses of the combination. And then they continued with uh, monotherapy, so just the NEVO, uh, for uh, either two years. Uh, in this study, they were continued uh, unless there was a, uh, evidence of non-response or there was evidence of uh, toxicity. So yes, they are continuing on the NEVO monotherapy, not the combination. The combination is only the four doses up front. Yeah, so meaning we don't know, meaning maybe these folks are just getting the NEVO for nothing now. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. We, we just do not know the answer to that question. Um, so this is uh, data from the same study but different arms of the study. And these arms combined NEVO with either sunitinib or pazopinib. Those are the two recognized first line uh, agents uh, in, uh, in renal cell. The overall response rate for the NEVO plus sunitinib arm, almost 54% and NEVO plus pazopinib arm, 45%. And when we look at their survival curves, this is now, because the study was started initially with the TKI and uh, NEVO, th they have longer follow-up. And so this is, the f this is time in months, this is the five-year mark. 
and this is probability of survival. At five years, the navel plus sunitinib arm has not yet reached the median. So this is fairly compelling and interesting uh, data that, that will need to be obviously uh, uh, reproduced in a larger study, but uh, clearly uh, very, very interesting. Uh, Can you go back one slide? Uh, the previous one? Yes. Yes, sir. So um, the, the, when we use the NEVO with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor with sunitinib or pazopinib, the toxicities, the high-grade side effects were much more uh, than when it was used with IPI. So uh, for practice-changing study, and Dr. Bitting showed us some of the data making my job easier. Uh, so the practice-changing study is a phase three study uh, was uh, looking at the IPI plus NEVO rather than NEVO with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor uh, at this point versus standard sunitinib. And this study was recently reported. You already saw this, uh, this graph. And for those individuals who were intermediate and poor risk, this is uh, time in months. You will note that the follow-up is not as as long as we've seen with the previous studies. But uh, the median survival for, uh, for the, the combination of immunotherapy is not yet being reached. Interestingly, in this study, those folks who were good risk did better with sunitinib alone. So that question will still, still need to be answered, are we using sunitinib appropriately or, uh, or, or not? So what does that mean? What does this study mean? Uh, this is uh, the current table of all the stuff that we have. And uh, with the phase three study showing what it did, uh, it is likely that uh, nivolumab in combination with ipilimumab will will uh, get approval for uh, first-line treatment. It might move earlier, immunotherapy might move earlier uh, uh, later on in 2018. Now, what I showed you was essentially, um, so, so here, you know, let me just kind of clarify what this is. This is the antigen-presenting cells that interacts with a whole bunch of these immune off switches and on switches. So on this side are the off switches, and on this side are the on switches. And uh, the data that I showed you so far, and the, the, where we've come in immunotherapy so far in renal cell, is only been with the PD-1 and the ctl 4 molecules. Uh, look at the, look at the and, this, and this may not be a, a complete list at this point. But uh, look at this uh, cartoon, and you can see how many other immune checkpoints or switches are uh, still out there that need, uh, that need to be looked at. Uh, some of them are already actively being looked at. We have this uh, RCC fraction study open that is looking at uh, LAG3, TIM3, and CUR. These are other immune checkpoints on the T cell. And what this study does is it keeps the NEVO as the base and then keeps switching uh, the other immune checkpoint inhibitor. Yes, sir? Are there any ability to test your tumor for these markers? So uh, where's the tumor well, on this cartoon? There's no tumor on this cartoon. No, but if, if you have inhibit, you know, the, the switching the tumor has the ability to activate the table inhibitor. So these, uh, you know, so these are switches on the T cell. So, so we're we're trying to manipulate the T cell. Where do they manipulate it from? That's where the the drug comes in. So 
you know, the PD-1 is manipulated by an anti-PD-1 antibody, that's NEVO. There's another one being looked at uh, in combination with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So pembrolizumab or Keytruda in combination with axetinib is being looked at in a phase three study that is ongoing. Um, there has been uh, well, some observations uh, that has led to conjecture that the expression of, uh, of a marker, the PDL1, that normally switches the PD1 uh, switch um, may impact outcomes. Um, this data came from the lung cancer trials where it was shown that those tumors that were PD-L1 positive and were treated with an anti-PD-1 actually did much, much better than those that are PD-L1 negative. That data has not clearly been borne out in either kidney cancer or melanoma and a bunch of other disease processes. There appears to be slightly higher response uh, in in those tumors that have PDL1 positivity. So in melanoma, for example, uh, if the tumor is PDL1 positive and is treated uh, with immune ma manipulation, uh, the response is about close to 70%, uh, as opposed to PDL1 negative tumors that, uh, that have a response of about 50%. Now, 50% is nothing to balk at. Uh, in melanoma, where traditional response rates used to be 10%. So we, we really can't use the PDL1 status at this point to, to not offer somebody that treatment if there's one in two chance of responding. That, plus the fact that the, the PDL1 testing is not yet been standardized on one platform. There are five different tests being used with a cutoff of 1%, 5%, 10%, 50%, 50%, and looking at the expression of PDL1 on the T cells versus looking, them, uh, looking at that in tumors. So I don't know if we really have a true biomarker to predict. And these, we don't need to look on the tumor. These we, we, we know uh, exist on the T cells and we're trying to switch them on or off. So, uh, so this, this study is already active, looking at multiple other uh, immune switches. And, uh, and just so that you know how, you know, it is confusing now what to use there are going. There are about 30 other immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, that are being looked at at this point. Yes, ma'am. So if I understand the question, uh, you know, is if somebody's had a prior IL-2 uh, and now goes on a VEGF therapy, would that impact the outcome? So are we saying that this patient uh, after IL-2 was progressing? Okay. So if the, if the patient is not progressing, then why would you start anything? Right, but if the response is continuing, why would you add a VEGF? You would not. But uh, the... It, it was an observation from a study called the AXIS study uh, that did actually, uh, so that was a study that looked at axetinib uh, in the phase three setting. 
and allowed prior treatment. So uh, there was a hypothesis generating kind of question that arose from that study because uh, patients could have received IL-2, patients could have received sunitinib and go on the study. Those folks who got IL-2 initially were progressing and then went on to axetinib versus those patients who previously received sunitinib and then went on to axetinib, there was a difference in their outcomes. And it appeared that prior exposure to immune, immune manipulation with IL-2 uh, improved outcomes for those folks. So that, but that was not how the study was designed, what the study was designed to look at. It's a, it's a good question to ask. You know, I think uh, some sort of immune manipulation uh, does impact uh, subsequent treatment, but we need to prove that. So, uh, so, so this is kind of where we are. And, um, you know, in years to come, uh, this, this talk is going to need more time. I thank you for your attention.